Uh, thanks very much for coming along this evening to this, the final part of the series of lectures that I've done trying to explain how we see things. And we've started off some time ago looking at the anatomy of the visual system. We'll run through those bits where they're relevant. And then we looked at where so-called visual system goes wrong with illusions. And then I tried to explain that, in fact, it's not going wrong. It's just the way we see. Now, the combination of both of those leads us to the topic of why we see what we do. Now, I'd like to say thank you to a number of people. Professor Richard Gregory, now deceased this summer. Um, wonderful teacher, brilliant books. Michael Bach, Bo Lotto, Michael Morgan, Dale Purves, Edward Adelson, Steve Dakin in London, Kitaoka in Kyoto, Nicholas Wade. Uh, to my staff at Mayday who provided some of the images here, particularly the patient images, Judith Johnson, Freddie Matz and my boys, and then Frank, Barbara and Dawn and my colleagues at Gresham who've been of tremendous help. Now Matthew Lukish said, seeing is deceiving. The rather eccentric son of a Swedenborgian and brother of Henry and Alice, William James, the famous brother who was the author, was actually a clinical psychologist. Whilst part of what we perceive comes through our senses from the object before us, another part, and it may be the larger part, always comes out of our own mind. This was said about a hundred years ago. And it's really astonishing, because we all think that vision comes from our eyes. It probably doesn't. We're probably making it all up. And why we're making it all up? Not only are we making it up, it's probably made up before us, generations before. I'm going to try and show you why we think this is the case. Now, we know that a particular object has a size and it has a direction. That's all we know about it. The shape of the image doesn't give us any information about this. We don't know how far away it is. The shape could represent any of an infinite number of um, sizes and distances. For example, the image of someone as they walk further away from you necessarily becomes smaller and smaller, as you know if ever you've taken a photograph. But actually, in our eyes, that person doesn't become smaller. Well, literally, in our eyes, they do, but it's in our brain that it doesn't. Now, let's assume that the human visual system has evolved over millennium from very primitive, let's call them shark detectors, assuming that we all came out of the ocean. Now, this brain is programmed for interpreting moving three-dimensional objects, and it's got to interpret an environment where these objects are distorted by perspective. So the retinal image, whether it comes from a real three-dimensional object or whether it only comes from a flat two-dimensional object, such as a painting or a photograph or a cinema film, it's flat and it's uncolored. But our perception of this image is very rich. It's in three dimensions, it's colored, it's textured, it moves, it's vivid. And furthermore, it occurs in a cluttered scene, which is also three-dimensional. So even data from two-dimensional images can be transformed into these three-dimensional perceptions. Now, the retinal image itself, as I mentioned, is ambiguous. It could represent an infinite variety of possible objects, not only shapes and sizes, but also luminance and reflectance. We don't know any of these things from the real world. All we have is a retinal image. Perceptions are also influenced by previous experience, and I showed you in my visual illusion lecture, even sexuality can change how you see things that are put in front of you. So, and finally, it may be influenced by what our ancestors saw, and these ancestors may not have even been humans. So the great and solved mystery of the mind, which still remains today, is how we see. Vision appears to be effortless and instantaneous. We open our eyes in the morning and everything seems to work. We just take it for granted. Seeing begins with an image, but it ends with perception. And perception and an image are completely different things. Perception is not a copy of the retinal image. Actually, it's constructed in the brain from a whole heap of very conflicting data. All of these data points end up giving us exactly the same image. They're all at different distances, they're at different angulations, but we get the same retinal image from them. And this problem involves a massive computing power. Roughly about half the cells in the brain receive visual input. So half of the human brain, which is a remarkable complex series of computers, is involved with vision but it's also conscious. So this information from the retinal image is processed by the brain to generate a percept, and this percept, or this perception, doesn't necessarily match the physical properties of what caused it originally. In fact, it definitely doesn't. So perception and so-called reality, 
are going to be two different things. So what sounded very stupid three slides ago when I told you you're making it all up, actually, I can show you from these previous slides, is actually true. Now, the camera image, when we take a picture and we then take a photograph, we develop it, is actually designed to be looked at by the human eye, and then it forms another image, which is the retinal image. Now, the retinal image is not a camera image. It's not been designed to be looked at by another human eye. And if you remember the talk on the murder of Annie Chapman when they didn't take photographs and the argument in court saying they could have actually imaged Jack the Ripper on the back of her eye if only they'd taken photographs, which they didn't, and the police were actually accused of being negligent. Now, if we did have a retinal image that was looked at by another eye, we'd need another internal eye to then look at this and then pass the information on to the higher centres. And this sort of um, version of how the brain works was pretty current when I was at school and pretty much what we thought about um, for several years afterwards. But remember, all the image on the retina is is a series of brightness numbers. It's a bunch of pixels, let's say from 1 to 256. And if you do that in a little tiny square, you've ended up with an infinite number of numbers, and it's a very complex thing to do. So this image is processed by the retina using very specialised analogue computers, the so-called centre surround receptive fields that we spoke about in the first lecture. And what this does is to enhance the light and dark borders and it extracts relative luminosity values. It doesn't tell us how bright anything is. It just tells us whether it's brighter than the thing next to it or brighter particularly than its background. Image formation has been known about for a long time, as we can see from this glass ball focusing light from a source which comes from the Opus Maius of Roger Bacon. The first person to realise that the eye did this was Johannes Kepler. He worked for Tycho Brahe, who he subsequently succeeded as imperial mag mathematician, and wrote a pamphlet called Ad Vitalonium Paralipomena, a supplement to Vitello. And Vitello, of course, was one of the... He was actually Dominican and actually stole Bacon's work and published it himself, as we showed in one of my earlier lectures. What Kepler did was to show how cones of light from an image, from an object, form an image. Now, this image is necessarily upside down in the back of the retina. This didn't surprise him. They knew about pinhole cameras, and pinhole cameras in invert the image as well. But what he realised as well was that this isn't something that's looked at by the brain. How this image is perceived, he says, I leave to the natural philosophers to argue about. Maybe it's in the hollows of the brain due to the activity of the soul. Maybe it is. There are problems with retinal images, and there are also problems with images that come from cameras. All optical devices, by necessity, have a number of imperfections in them. The lens is based on a spherical... Um, configuration, so it causes spherical aberration. You can make aspheric lenses, as we saw from those Viking lenses in the lecture on spectacles, which do remarkable feats, and the projector lens that we're using here, in just above your heads, has an aspheric lens in it, which tries to get rid of the aberrations, but you can see it's possibly not as effective as it might be. You also get chromatic aberration. The reason you get chromatic aberration is that a lens focuses blue light in a different place from yellow light into a different place from red light. And then you get optical aberrations because particularly in, well, the Hubble telescope had optical aberrations when they first sent it up. It had to be corrected mathematically. The human eye has optical aberrations as seen by these aberration diagrams where red is showing the focus in front of the retina, blue behind, and these images are not perfectly focused. This is normal. This is what we normally see. And this is Van Gogh's painting down in Arles and the bend in the river. Actually, if you go there, be prepared to be disappointed because the actual polar star isn't there. It's around the other bend in the river. And I spent several nights being a bit disappointed not working this out. But look at the blur he's showing there. And it isn't because Van Gogh couldn't see. He could see. What he was painting was the normal spherical aberrations of the human eye, which increase as the pupil enlarges. So the wider the aperture of the camera, the more aberrations you're going to get. Now, when the eye's focused for mid-spectrum, let's say green, the blue light is blurred and cannot contribute, and it causes blur. And some people have thought this is why the back of the eye in the centre has yellow pigment, and the macula is sometimes called the macula lutea, which is Latin for yellow, because it absorbs the blue light and stops the blue cones messing about with the image quality. Furthermore, there are very few blue cones in the centre of your eye. They're more distributed to the mid-periphery. And it's a nice theory, 
But unfortunately, the facts get in the way of all good theories, and it turns out that monochromatic blur is many, many times worse. Now, this is not to say the retina doesn't form an image. It does. And as we saw, this is the optogram that was taken from a rabbit retina immediately after sacrifice by Willy Kuna. And what he did was to fix the retina into alum. And he has the image here of the bar of the cage the rabbit was in and the window of his laboratory. This created great excitement at the time, of course. And this is why people thought you could get images of murderers on the back of victims' eyes. And furthermore, Willie Kuna didn't help it because he claimed to have obtained an image from the retina of an executed criminal in 1880. However, the point is, is you have to fix it because this visual pigment decays in seconds after death and by 60 seconds it's completely gone. That's why very few ophthalmologists have ever seen the beautiful colour of visual purple when we examine eyes, partly because we bleach it when we look in uh, with bright lights, but the main reason is, is even in dissection post-mortem, it's already gone. We mentioned these analogue computers called receptive fields, and I think I should just briefly remind us what they're about. Um, they were discovered by putting an electrode into the retina and recording from these cells called ganglion cells. What was interesting, in the complete dark, ganglion cells fire. Tick, 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 going along, which is quite interesting. Um, and if you shine a bright light on the eye, the ganglion cells go tick, 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 tick. They don't change. And that really freaked people out. That was a really unusual, because most people think the eye sees light, shine a light in it, you're going to get some response. Well, you don't. What actually happens if you shine a small spot of light in, on certain cells, these on cells, you get a burst of firing. Tick, 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 tick. And if you actually shine it on these type of cells, you get tick, tick. Tick, 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 tick. So they stop firing. These are called off cells, and these are called on cells. What's interesting, if you move the spot off to the side, the on cell immediately stops firing. So here we have an analogue computer that compares, it subtracts the light that's falling on one part of its receptive field from the other. And light and on and off cells are equally distributed in the retina because dark things occur in nature just as much as bright things, rather like the print on the back of this slide here is dark against light, and we would be using off-ganglion cells to represent that. What happens at the end with this processing is, is what we tend to do is to highlight edges of objects, and we tend to see them enhanced more brightly, and the dark areas become more dark, and this helps us process the retinal image. Now, after we leave the eye, remember we go through a crossing. What's interesting in this ancient Arabic manuscript is you can still see the seat of vision. It's believed to be in the centre of the eye in the lens. By the time that Chevalier John Taylor drew this diagram, it was realised that the lens was a focusing mechanism. But what Chevalier John Taylor did was to take further Newton's discovery that the vision was crossed and to show it's half crossed. It's a hemifixation of the image. So what this means is that everything from this half of the field of these two eyes goes on to this eye and goes to this part of the brain and everything that's on this half goes to this bit and goes to this half of the brain. The reason it's called a chiasm is because it looks like the chi and this is the beautiful Cairo in the Gospel according to Matthew and it says Christi autem generation erat. They didn't actually write like we did, and it's mixed up all over the part in different, it's a bit like children write in a way, but much more beautiful. And this is that Cairo chiasm, as you can see, the crossing. Now, the digital output from this retina has now been sent on, after it's crossed, to this organ here, which is called the thalamus. The thalamus is in the centre of the brain. It's about the size of a walnut, and let's imagine it as the switchboard of the brain. All sensory input, whether it's from fingers, whether it's from toes, whether it's from hearing or sight, uses the thalamus for a relay. 85% of the input of the thalamus, however, isn't from um, sensory organs at all. It's from centres that are aware of uh, attention, awareness, motor functions and sleep. And also, it gets a lot of input from the primary visual cortex, so the vision centres come back down, and nobody knows what they do, but it must have something to do with top-down processing, telling us something about what we already know before we send it up. The remainder of it is from the eye. There's another little nucleus here, which we're going to come to, called the superior colliculus, which represents an archaic nucleus present in um, primitive uh, forms of life, 
uh, called the tectum because it's the roof of the original brain. And this is concerned with eye movements and head and neck movements. What we do with the image is we map it. And there's a point-to-point -point relationship, as Kepler showed. So everything on this half is here and crosses over and goes to this lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. And everything on the green half goes over to the other one, which I haven't showed you. There's a duplication of these cells called the parvo cells and then the M cells. And nobody knows why there's a duplication. It could have been an accident. It could have a function. There's also branches come off to the superior colliculus as well, representing that archaic pathway we mentioned. So what's the purpose of the retinal image? It's to compare the number of photons absorbed by different photoreceptors. The larger and better quality image you're going to get from larger eyes, which is why nocturnal animals and birds have large eyes. But you then downgrade the image quality, unfortunately. Now, the image is converted into a map, as we showed you. This is a primitive bug detector on the left-hand side of a frog. And this little juicy, tasty morsel flies into place and goes onto the receptive field, which immediately fires. This one doesn't. This fires and it goes onto the roof where it's mapped very accurately. From this map, immediately beneath it, is a motor map. And it's connected point to point. Automatically, this goes to the spinal cord, goes to the muscles on the other side and the neck and the eyes move towards the prey, the tongue comes out and that's the last thing that that insect ever sees. Now it's quite interesting because Jacques Vaucanson invented these wonderful automaton which actually influenced how Descartes thought the um, uh, body and the brain worked um, because they were completely automatic. We have a completely automatic system here. The frog doesn't even have to think. Over here, tongue out, back in, dinner. Now, we also map as well as frogs, and here's a real image. Um, the projection seems to be dark here, unfortunately, but you might just get an image that you've got a little white clot here, which has blocked off the retina in this um, part. It's starved of its oxygen supply, and it's died. But the visual field defect we get is down below. This is the same patient. So we've got an inversion. Now, the inversion actually doesn't really matter. And it didn't bother Australians for the first 200 years of their existence until they then invented this map because they suddenly realised they couldn't navigate around unless they had the map of the world showing it from an Australian perspective. I think, actually, there are also maps of South London that can help spouses navigate when you go to Croydon <laughs> and uh, Brighton. But uh, I, I think that's only a rumour. I haven't seen any yet. I've certainly not dared suggest uh, that we should buy one. I just take the second on the left as told and end up in exciting new places. Now, we also know that different parts of the brain do different jobs. And this was introduced by Albertus Magnus. And here's this beautiful fresco of him in Trefiso. We saw the other frescoes because they also, this, this cycle shows the earliest images of anyone wearing glasses or any magnifying aids for um, vision. But this is Albertus Magnus, who's further around in the series. After leaving the thalamus, this processed information goes to the occipital lobe of the brain, which is at the back. The scene is then mapped again and further processing takes place and this edited information is then transmitted across the whole surface of the brain, the, the whole back half, both the temporal parietal lobes and it goes to specific areas that do specific tasks, what we call the higher centres. Now, some of you will know this image. Um, it's actually by a former Gresham professor and it's the first accurate description of the brain in the world literature. And it was done by a sometime architect called Christopher Wren who was very familiar with anatomy and built a small building just down the end of this street, as some of you saw when you came up from the tube station. Um, he also made models of muscles and he made models of eyes and he did a lot of his work by injecting India ink and wax into the carotid arteries. And this enabled Thomas Willis um, in Oxford to do the first accurate description of the blood supply of the brain in cerebral anatomy. But they came up with a really peculiar and interesting theory of how the brain was working. They decided that the corpus striatum was for sensory, the corpus callosum, which is inside the brain and fibres going across here, converted perception and imagination into the hard overlying tissue here, the grey matter, the cortex, which they thought of as the core or, or the, the peel of an orange. So the main bit of the brain was the juicy bit on the inside, and then the peel was actually not considered to do very much at all, except to store memories. This theory of the brain had widespread influence for several centuries. Now, Francesco Gennari was dissecting a brain as a medical student in between going to the pub. 
and as medical students are wont to do. The problem with Janori was he didn't stop going to the pub and died young of severe alcoholism and lack of money from going to the bookies on the way home from the pub. But that's a sad story to what was a brilliant man because when he did these frozen sections, you can definitely see there's a white line here which is not present in this part of the rind or the cortex. This was the first intimation, in fact, that the orange peel is not uniform. There are different bits of the orange peel and they've got different structures. Maybe this could mean they're doing different things. He then says, I do not know the purpose for which this substance was created. More detailed analysis, once microscopes had been invented and used, was done by this chap, Bob. And what he showed was there's definite distinct variations in the structure of this rind in the brain. And the cells are very different. This is looking at the outside of the left-hand side, and this is looking at the inside of the right-hand side of the brain after we peel the two parts. And what we find is this area here, called 17, which has very specialised structure indeed, and this was what Gennari had found without using the microscope. We have a temporal lobe here, which comes down to the temple. We have a parietal lobe, which is at the back. We have an occipital lobe, which is at the occiput. And then we have a frontal lobe. And we'll use those words again from time to time, so just a little aid memoir. Now, vision is located in the occipital lobe. Franz Joseph Gall, who amongst being a complete nutter invented phrenology, was also a very, very bright neuroanatomist before he went into his daytime job. And he noticed at school that boys with phenomenal memory also had bug eyes, and he called them les yeux à fleur de tête. So he proposed this was due to an overdevelopment of the frontal lobes. He then went on to study medicine, and he was the first person to resect the crossing fibres that showed that motor function, if anyone's ever met anyone with a stroke, is on the opposite side, a bit like vision, a bit like frogs, isn't it? It's quite interesting how we cross all this stuff over, as well as having it upside down. It doesn't seem to bother us, but um, it's just interesting. He was the first person to show that. And what he proposed was the different functions in different areas. The white matter isn't the stuff that's interesting in the brain. That's just the wiring. That's just the copper wiring. And he also proposed that the brain was so folded to save space. If it wasn't folded like that, we would have to have brains of enormous size. And this would be very inconvenient to get through doors and onto tube tracings and stuff like this. So um, this was a revolutionary thought, and it was contrary to religion, and so he wasn't very popular. Now this chap, Bartolomeo Panizza, um, examined some brains of people who'd had strokes and who were blind, and he found that the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, was crucial for vision. His discovery, of course, was completely ignored, as many were. He was a follower of Gaul, and that probably didn't help his case, because everyone by now was convinced that Gaul was mad. And except for people doing phrenology, and some people still do phrenology, you might see them in antique shops, those um, um, heads where they've all been said, and you know you've got some function here and something here. So it took some horrible wars to prove this guy right. Now, head injuries have been known in war for a long time, and these are drawings that were done by the English surgeon uh, after the Peninsula War battles. And you can see a very good head injury here um, from a bullet wound. Um, his gloves and saw still exist, and he sawed off Uxbridge leg at the Battle of Waterloo, saving his life. But he wasn't actually particularly good at saving lives in his earlier career. On the 17th of September in 1862, the bloodiest battle in American history took place when General McClellan confronted Lee's army of Northern Virginia at Sharpsburg. This became known as the Battle of Antietam. The 4th New York Division were on the left, attacking up onto here, and this chap, who had just come from Ireland and joined up the volunteers, got shot in the head with one of these, which was made just down the road in England and shipped out in large numbers to the southern cause. And it was a musket, and it was very heavy, and it made one hell of a hole in his head. And um, amazingly, he survived. And we discussed his story of the, uh, one of my previous lectures about how he survived, and the, uh, basically the surgeons left him alone. If they'd fiddled with him, he'd have been dead. Anyway, he turns up eight years later where Dr. Keenan Thompson examined him in New York. And he's complaining that the sight in his right eye, you can't see out of it, says it's poor. However, whiskey affects him as usual, and his sexual prowess was undiminished. So they carefully plotted the visual field, and lo and behold, what they found was the same as I found when I plotted this visual field in a patient who'd had a stroke in the occipital cortex, which, as we know, is at the back here. And this is what he meant when he said the vision in my right eye is bad. What he actually meant, the vision on my right-hand side is bad. And what they showed was that the map of the brain is bisected through the middle. So the map is centred on where you look, on what we call foveal fixation. So fixation is where the map is centred. 
And this was an amazing and important discovery, and we'll come on to it. Now remember, images is just a pattern of light and dark on the back of the eye, or, or on a photographic film. A map is a device for transmitting information. It's amazing what sorts of information you can transmit with a map. For example, you can tell people where to go on the tube, and here is an original tube map. You can actually discuss the migration of languages, and this is how the early primitive languages, so-called primitive, migrated from this area down into Central America. You could have a spatial map, like the Paris tube map, which is chaotic, compared to Harry Beck's beautiful 1931 wiring diagram, which tells us about connections and how you move from one connection to the other. You can also have non-spatial maps, like Wiles' map here of civilizations, then in 1815. And as Morgan says in his book, you know, it colours the countries according to civilization level. So you've got England, which is five, and you've got Canada here, unfortunately, which only is two, because it contains cannibals and Frenchmen. <laughs> but this is rather better, because it's elevated above Australia. We're not sure why, whether it's the cannibals or the Frenchmen that elevated it, and Australia scores a lowly one. Um, we met Booth's poverty map of just south of Michael Minnelli's office here. And these dark areas, um, it actually says, I think you might not be able to read it, it says that um, vicious, semi-criminal. And what's interesting is walking down this road the other day, I noticed how many of them were hedge fund managers and bankers. <laughs> and so However, in a previous time, the Booth poverty map, this was Hanbury Street, of course, where Mary Chapman was found murdered by her flatmate um, outside that terrible morning um, in 1880 when Jack the Ripper um, did her in. Now, bullets got a bit more sophisticated and guns got a bit faster, so we got more precise injuries. And here's this poor chap who was shot through the brain and ended up with a very, very specific injury. And this enabled the very young Japanese ophthalmologist, Noe, to start to map very carefully what bits of the brain did different bits. And what he found was remarkable he found that this bit, most of the visual cortex here, most of it is concerned with a tiny bit of central vision. In fact, what's even more extraordinary is the central 2.5 degrees, the tiny bit there, is represented by an enormous fraction as well. So there's a massive magnification of vision which is occurring in the brain. More sophisticated analysis was done at the back of this area here, looking into this deep groove which this picture shows opened up. It's not opened up in life, we're opening it up to have a look at it to explain what's going on. And a very, very detailed map was shown, which actually shows what had already been known, but in more detail, and that's the bottom represents the top of the vision, and the top represents the bottom of the vision, so inversion. But in very great detail, you can see the tiny bit in the centre is represented disproportionately by a large area at the back. Modern mapping is even more sophisticated and shows that even this was wrong. This is the central area. It's taking up a massive amount of brain computing power to compute what you're seeing in the tiny central bit of your vision. It's called the cortical magnification factor. And here is the same type of thing that occurs in the sensory cortex um, and it shows that there's bits of our bodies are slightly more important than others depending whether you're a man or a woman and mouths and tongues of course are very important so are hands and so the brain expands and makes them larger and if we actually drew that as a map that's what we'd get and we wouldn't get a map that looks like a map if we drew the map of the visual cortex what we get a map is of what the visual cortex is doing and what it's doing is using these columns here which are composed of different cells as super analog computers and these columns are about two millimeter square and the whole of this cortex is tiled with these two millimeter square tiles each of which is a vertical supercomputer and here they are in more detail this is the tiling shown here it looks a bit like zebra stripes brown stripes representing left eyes white so lighter stripes representing the other eye and they're closely and intimately together and what happens is stuff comes in from the left eye and it stays in the left eye and goes into Gennari's white stripe that we saw earlier. And stuff comes from the right eye and goes into Gennari's white stripe, but in this column. And these columns at this level are separate, they're monocular. Leaving here, it's then processed and the eyes then come together. And this is where the images start coming together and a lot of processing goes on here for binocular vision, that means using two eyes together for depth perception, for early bits of movement in primates um, and other 
um, mammals, but not in rabbits, who actually have movement detectors elsewhere. Now, what's interesting about these is that, you remember we showed on the retina, they had those circulars around. The, the, these cells don't respond to circles, they respond to lines. And these lines have to move and they've got to be tilted very precisely for that particular cell. So this cell is orientated to a vertical one and as soon as you go off vertical, the response starts going down. So you've got a vertical line there, tick, 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 goes down, tick, 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 and then stops, tick, tick, background. So we're actually inhibiting its response when we move to 90 degrees. These are fairly large, these receptor fields in the periphery, and they're rather small in the centre. So the size near the fovea is about a quarter of a degree, which is about half the size of the moon, um, substanding so an angle on the eye. In the periphery, though, they're quite large. They represent one degree. There are different types of these. You get complex cells. Um, and about 20% of these cells respond to a particular direction of movement. So not only does your bar have to be moving, it's got to be moving in a certain direction, which is kind of interesting. These are much larger, these receptor fields. And because you've got complex cells, and the Americans discovered that you've got to have hyper-complex cells. And these come in two varieties. They're called N-stopped, and then there's different types. And what these are doing is responding, as you can see, in different ways. So if you actually make... If, if the bar's got to be just so. If it's too small, it doesn't respond. If it's just so, it responds maximally. And if it's too big these hypercomplex cells stop responding again. So these hypercomplex cells are telling us about sizes and widths and lengths of images. It also tells us about borders and how they cross, and it helps us determine where edges are of curved and squares. We've moved a long way from looking at different pixels now. What we're looking at here are probably garbor patches, as they're called. Now, what these garbor patches are doing, if we put them all together, they're telling us about texture. And you need a lot less stored information if you're looking at textures of scenes than you do of pixels of scenes. Because just a small one millimeter area at 256 times 256 in your camera is going to take up an enormous and unbelievable amount of computing power. We'd probably need brains the size of this room if we were going to walk around and use that as the way we were going to process the image. Now, Garbor patch is much better. And these actually represent, even artificially, really rather original and realistic looking textures. And the visual scene turns out to be full of these textures. And using garbled patches, we can already start to see the retinal image decomposing here. And we can see a shape occurring. And if they could turn up, if someone could bicycle a bit harder and make the light a bit brighter, we'd see some other bits in there that I can see on my computer, but unfortunately you can't. Now, information is extracted from the visual cortex in these columns. And we do several bits, stereopsis, depth perception. And how we're doing that is the images in the two eyes now come together in this area. We've got orientation lines. And as we go down, each bit of the column as you go down has an orientation a certain way. So all 360 degrees of orientation are represented. And then furthermore, there's blobs in these areas. And these blobs are cylindrical and other bits of processing go on there. And they're probably related to things such as colour. And there are red-green cells here that respond to local colour contrast before sending the image upstream. Upstream means to other visual areas, which are called the associated visual areas. And this chap worked in the lunatic asylum, as they were called in those days, in the West Riding of Yorkshire. Probably a busy chap from the last time I was in the West Riding of Yorkshire, <laughs> but anyway. What he did was to electrically stimulate the brains of animals and um, he then worked out there was a map and certain things were happening in different areas and a patient came in who was paralysed. He predicted where the tumour was and the surgeon, Mr McEwen, went in and removed it safely. For this he became famous. He then went on to study vision in this area and the problem here was that he didn't quite get it absolutely right but what he accidentally discovered was probably more important. He took out the occipital lobe and actually found they still had vision. But as I've shown you, you've got to take out every single last bit of it because if you just take out the back bit, you're only taking out central vision because of the magnification. If you leave the last 5%, you're leaving 95% of the vision behind. So that's why he couldn't show this. What he did was to take out this area and then he found out that the monkeys couldn't reach for a cup of tea because, of course, they were British monkeys that drink <laughs> tea. Whereas Herman Monk in Berlin didn't offer his monkeys tea and violently disagreed with this. And once he was asked, so what about Mr. Ferrier's experiments? I have not said anything about Ferrier's work because there's nothing good to say about it. <sighs> Vicious. Mr. Ferrier has not made one correct guess. All his statements have turned out to be wrong. 
What he'd actually done was to remove a visual association area. And this was the area that's converting vision into signals that we can then use to direct movement. We're beyond just simply vision here. And it turns out that there are two ways that images can probably be processed. And we have two streams. We have this stream down into the temporal lobe and we have this stream up into the parietal lobe. So it could be that the visual image is first processed in the visual cortex, V1, and then it passes intact through a series of filters for further processing to extract perception, that elusive goal, perception, rather like awareness. We don't know where it is, we know what it is, but we don't know where it is. Or images could be broken down in the visual cortex, decomposed, and different parts of them could be sent to different individual analog computers that specifically do one job. Now that's the problem with analog computers. They're actually brilliant at what they do, but they only do one thing. But, so you need lots of them. But that's not a problem for the brain. Look at this. There's billions of cells and billions of connections in the human brain. There are more connections in the human brain than there are stars in the known universe. So we don't have a problem with the number of cells. We can make as many analog computers as we like. And that's precisely what we do. And these areas, called V1 is the visual cortex, and then there's V2, V3, V4, V5, and then there's a couple of other ones which we'll mention that don't fall into the V. So V2 is the very next one, straight after the visual cortex. V2 wraps around this area here. And V2 is a map, and it's a mirror image map of the V1 map. It, the input comes both from the visual cortex here, and it goes into these stripes, and then it's broken down into parallel streams. So one goes up to colour, one's involved with form, and there's another stream that comes from V1 that misses it altogether and goes to this area called MT that is involved with motion and stereo perception. So what we're having now is broken down separate channels that deal with different parts of the visual image, different parts of perception. And this is called parallel processing. So for example, orientation of depth, orientation of images and the depth perception is done in this area, V3. And this comes up through two separate pathways. One is coming from V2, where a little bit of processing of something might be done, and one native, straight out of the visual cortex. And these two different ways um, could be responding in these different pathways, up into the parietal lobe here, which is going to deal with motion in large patterns, and then ventrolateral down here, which is going to deal with movement and where things are. So analysis of colour. It turns out this is in another area called V4, discovered by Semir Zeki uh, in London. And this receives its information mainly from these thin stripes and some from the interstripes, but this is involved with a different parallel stream for form. And there's other areas, V5, as we've mentioned before. Now the analysis of motion is really important. Um, it's a separate sensation. It's rather like smell or taste. Motion is not a series of still images that we add up. So how do we analyse depth? Well, we've mentioned before that the retinal image, or any image that's a shadow, doesn't actually tell us about what could have made it. Any of these conformations of these completely different structures, if the lighting is right, could cast that shadow or that image. So we now know that the retinal image is inherently ambiguous. And this can be used from a number of ways, such as these trompe l'oeil. This is not really a piece of marble. They ran out of money when they built this room, so they had to paint it on. Not only that, they had to paint on the columns, which don't show well, and are actually less successful. But we get a real 3D perception here, and it's completely fake. And the reason we get that 3D perception is we are making assumptions. We're making assumptions about the image, we're making assumptions about where the light comes from. We make a number of assumptions. Now, even though the image is flat on the back of the retina, it contains loads of information that we can extract information about depth from. It's got perspective. The shape on the retina, as we said, is ambiguous, and perspective can suggest three dimensions if we make certain assumptions. You can get texture gradients. So down here, which it should show, I don't know if it's possible to turn the juice up on the projector, but it would be extremely helpful from our point of view, if that's possible. Um, here shows the grass is rather coarse, and as we go up here, it gets finer and finer until it's painted as uniform green. That's roughly how we see it as well. So texture gradients that are more dense and more coarse 
um, represent nearer things. We get shape from shading. This only works if we know where the light source is from. And for most of our evolution, the lights come from above. So these shadows are telling us where things are and what their shape is. And there are special cells in the area V4 that measure the shadow below. If you rotate the image 90 degrees, they stop firing. Interruption of lines. Jesus' cross interrupts the walls. So we know the walls are behind. And we've got specialised cells in V1 that tell us about that. I showed you them earlier, the end stop cells. Upward sloping ground tells us that these guys are further away than these guys. Size constancy. We physiologically expand the image. So these guys are drawn small, this guy is drawn big, but we don't see these people as dwarves. We see them as the same size people who are further away. So psychologically we're expanding the perception of this small image. And then finally there's atmospheric perspective. Things that are blue due to Rayleigh scattering, it's called, in the atmosphere, are further away. So lots of stuff you can get out of this simple image if you look for it, and that's precisely what the brain does. Now, shape from shading is quite important because it depends on where the angle of light is from. These are identical, and in good light, this looks like buttons, and this looks like a depression, and this looks like a depression, because we assume the light comes from above. Identical image, just inverted. And here, it's important for recognising faces. Upside down faces can be difficult to recognise. And there's something not quite right about this image. And if we do turn it the right way up, we'll realise how important it is, orientation with respect to gravity and lighting for, for our images and understanding. What we've done here is just to turn the mouth and the eyes upside down. We can't tell that when we look at a face upside down because we're so used to seeing faces the right way up. And we're hardwired to see faces the right way up. So this is the same image. And there it is. That was a really bad day at work, I can tell you. <laughs> now, chiaroscuro light and shade. This technique was used in the Renaissance to make depth and reality to their paintings. And this is Gerard David's painting on the rest of the flight to Egypt. Now, as we got later into development of the Industrial Age, lighting could come from below. And this painting in the National Gallery actually is really rather interesting. Not only just because it's showing that light can come from below, but it's also, this is a planisphere and it's showing how the planets and the moon rotate. And these faces represent the different phases of the moon, as you can see. So here's the full moon and here is the moon at either side. And um, it's a rather interesting take when you go and look at that painting and um, it's rather fun. Analysis of distance. You could use motion parallax like the pigeons used to do in Trafalgar Square before, before the uh, mayor shot them all. And um, what they do, if you ever look at a pigeon, they do this. And what they do when they're doing this is this moves faster if it's nearer and it moves slower if it's further away. And that tells me where this is compared to this. It also tells me if it's approaching me. And that's why pigeons fly off if you're not carrying anything that they want to eat. And so we've got purpose-built range detectors to judge distance. Now, a random stereogram, um, which this isn't, but I put it on to show you what one's like because you need to have two eyes and need a special instrument to actually see it. What it does is it changes between the two eyes the image um, very slightly in an area here. And when it's looked at with two eyes, 93% of the population suddenly see something in three dimensions jumping out at them, square or a circle. Now what's happening here is a shift of only a few thousandths of a millimetre changes the light on a single cone receptor by about 5% and that's enough to cause it to fire. Upstream of this, individual cells which have receptive fields in different places can detect. So we can detect very, very, very tiny amounts of disparity, smaller than a cone, by using this mechanism. And these parallax detectors are really important. Motion. Very difficult to depict. This is Maxim and this is Freddy racing round this circuit and the photograph makes them look still. More than that, this is the daguerreotype. It was the first photograph of a street scene ever and this is crowded. It's rush hour. The only thing you can see here is the boot man um, blacking the boots of his customer who stayed long enough for it to be impressed onto the daguerreotype. And when Morse came to visit Paris to look at this wonderful Morse of Morse code, he said, moving objects are not impressed. Now, 
And the sense of movement is very, very specific, and it's computed directly from the retinal image. If you want to show things moving, rather like this little dog running along, you, you have to make them have lots of legs, really. Um, Dynamism of a dog on a lead by Jacques Morbala. Now, we have a movement detector. I've mentioned it's present at retina, and it's in the brain of monkeys and of us. What happens is that this car is racing along in this direction. As it trips this wire, it fires. And then as it trips this wire, it fires. If these images fire together, we know that this is coming along this way. And the reason we do is there's a delay built in here, which is called a synapse. So if this fires, and it's coming up here. This then fires, and it comes up. By the time this hits here, that one hits there. So if they fire simultaneously, we know there's a movement moving along this direction. We have movement detectors that go the other way as well. And we have movement detectors in both eyes that dispect D the disparity ones also can detect movement and th that can tell us movement in three dimensions uh, of the parallax and we use that as a sort of test by delaying images in one eye or as a natural experiment in multiple sclerosis when the nerve becomes sick at the back of the eye people lose this ability, this delay now analog computers we mentioned are good so wh why do we have so many maps? it's because these things only do one thing so we need a map of each thing we do practically not all the maps are geographical maps by any means, but they're all centered on one frame of reference, and that frame of reference is your foveal fixation. So if you move off, all the maps come into register wherever they are in your brain on this fixation. Many analog computers, they're all working at the same time, lots of different maps, all having different functions, as in this big map room in the Doge Palace. There's lots of different maps, lots of different types of maps in there. Object recognition, facial recognition, colour, movement, these are all different jobs that are being done. Now, Beau Lotto and Dale Purvis came up with this probabilistic model of vision. They're saying that we're using experience to learn and we're using experience for sight. And what they mean by this is we adjust the weighting of what we experience by what the likely outcome is. And what I mean by that is that um, if we look at a dog it smells like a dog, it probably is a dog, all right? Might not be, it could be a cat, could be a wolf, but mostly in our environment, it's going to be a dog. Now, a binary, a digital computer, which is all or none, is of no use to us in this messy real world where noise degrades the information. What we need is a learning computer. This is the perceptron, which was based on how to win at horse races, okay? So here we've got an outcome, it's a win. Now, if we have no information from the weather, we don't put any information, we wipe it off. If the form was important, and it sometimes is, what we do is we increase the input from form. The ground wasn't important, it was a dry day, didn't affect it. The jockey, very important, Kieran Fallon. Right, we're going to increase this, going to have a bit more input this time. And the weight they're carrying around can also slow a horse down as it's going around the track. Next time, it loses. So we adjust all the things again. And if we do this hundreds and hundreds of times, we eventually end up with a very good predictor of what's going to make our horse win. Now, this learning computer is using Bayes' theorem. Now, this theorem is that we have a model, which is called a prior. We then collect some evidence, and then we alter the model as is needed, and then we develop a posterior. It's a generative model. We're generating the model according to the data. Sometimes we get it wrong. The moon is about as bright as a lump of coal. It has the same reflectance. But most people, when they look at a lump of coal, think it looks black. And most people, when they look at the moon, think it looks white. This is because the moon is reflecting against a background that is totally dark. And by, so things that are reflecting that are brighter than their background are white. Things that are reflecting lower than their background, so most times we see coal, the background's brighter than the coal, it looks dark. And one of the wonderful experiments NASA did was to hold up lumps of coal in a darkened room illuminated by secret spot lamps, and the coal glowed beautifully white, rather like the moon. This probabilistic strategy is based on past experience, and it probably explains this difference between what we see and what is reality. And I have a difficulty with Bolotto of that because I don't know what reality is. I mean, reality, again, depends on the definition, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Sometimes you end up with two stories that could be, and this is the Necker cube that we've seen before, and if we look at this image for long enough, it suddenly 
flips. So we can either have a cube coming out at us, or we can have a cube going away from us. And it just spontaneously flips. The brain cannot make up its mind, so it chooses both. This could be a duck, or it could be a rabbit with its ears here. And we can look at that, and it could be either a duck or a rabbit. So we flip. We can't make a decision. See, they're two equally valid. So what Bolotto is saying, and he's got a book coming out um, next month, uh, no, two months' time, called Why We See What We Do. And this isn't a trailer for that. I only found out the book was coming out after I put the title in um, last year. But it should be a very good book. What he's saying is that the evidence drawn from their experiments on perception of brightness, colour and geometry support the idea of Bishop Berkeley's dilemma. Um, his dilemma was, how do we know what's going on when the retinal image is so uncertain of what it is? What he's saying is, we make a probable guess of what it is. And what that guess is that we see depends on our own experience. It depends on what our grandparents saw. It depends on what their grandparents saw, because if they got it wrong and they got the shark detector wrong, they were going to get eaten. So we've actually evolved a very, very sophisticated series of complex analog computers to analyse vision. And we're doing it rather like the perceptron. We're modifying. Every time we see something, we get it wrong, we modify the inputs until we get it right. And guess what? After we've done this thousands and countless of thousands of times in childhood, we get rather good at it. Now, if this is true, we shouldn't need a retinal image to have a perception at all. And of course we don't. Hunter Davis's book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, describes these amazing images coming out of the carpet and threatening to eat him. When he's slightly overdosed, they decided in the open-top car to take all the LSD, all the uppers and all the downers in one go. And they arrived at the hotel and all the whiskey, completely out of their um, trees. And there's this remarkable passage where he describes what's going on. Coleridge fell asleep after laudanum, just after he'd read a passage about the garden of Kublai Khan, and of course that led to a wonderful work of art. De Quincey observed, though, it, um, you might not have a wonderful work of art. If a man took opium whose talk was about oxen, then he would just dream about oxen. Um, Johannes Peter Muller, we met before, actually. He was the son of a Koblenz shoemaker, physiologist, and he wrote on fantasy images, and he was experimenting with hallucinations. Some people, just before they fall asleep, or just when they wake, get a very, very vivid um, visual hallucination, particularly if you rather overdo the drugs. And in his time, those drugs were caffeine and alcohol. And he was experimenting, and sleep-deprived, and caffeine led to him having a mental breakdown. He actually recovered from this, and in April 1827, married the beautiful and talented musician Nanny Zyla, and immediately broke down. So if that is an advertisement for marriage, perhaps you need to watch the cafe. Um, what's happening here, in summary, is we've got these inputs from these centres around fields. What we're doing here, and in the lateral geniculate ganglion, is extracting lines. We're not doing anything else, we're extracting lines. Where it's dark, where it's bright. We then process this, and then they come up into binocular cells, which means they're fed from both eyes. So these are fed from one or the other eye. They then feed into these binocular cells, and they go through separate channels which analyse colour, form, motion, which is a separate visual sensation. It's a separate sensation. And what we end up doing is transforming this series of garbor patches in V1 into a complex, beautiful, vivid, three-dimensional, moving image set in a textured background. And it's so important that we do this accurately and get it right every time so that we know that that's dinner and that the shark is not. So to summarise George Barclay, I mean, he went quite far, actually, and he said, uh, it is indeed, in my opinion, strangely prevailing amongst men that houses, mountains, streams and rivers, and in fact, all objects have an existence that's natural or real, distinct from their being perceived by the understanding. What he's actually saying here is nothing out there is real. It's just going on in our heads. And this wonderful limerick was then written. It says, there was a young man who said, God must find it extremely odd to think that the tree should continue to be when there's no one about in the quad. And an anonymous response to this was, dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I'm always about in the quad, and that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully God. <laughs> and of course, Samuel Johnson said, I refute Berkeley thus, and kicked the stone, proving that the stone was real. However, he didn't refute Berkeley at all. All he did was to say, I have a sensation at the end of my toe that makes me believe that there is a stone there, but it could have still also been in his head. <laughs>
So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I hope that's actually gone some way to helping us realise how complex vision is and that it is not as straightforward as we see when we wake up in the morning and open our eyes. It's a terribly complicated process that involves over half the computing power of our brain, which is using a tremendous amount of energy, even when you're asleep, when you have your visual hallucinations and your dreams. So thank you very much indeed.